solving the Web3 grant problem with quadratic acceleration. And there will be some shilling in this talk for sure. <laughs> A little bit about myself. I go by 0x Justice in crypto space. My name is Justice Condor. My background over the past few years has been like right in the middle of the grants problem. I was helping out with grants with Bank of Stow. When there was a Polygon DAO, I started with Polygon, my relationship with them as a grants evaluator, and then came on full time Polygon Labs to basically do their community grants program governance, which is a hundred million Matic equivalent a year distribution. And now Quadratic Accelerator co-founder along with uh, Griff and uh, Tam who's not here. Uh, none of this is financial or legal advice. Okay, so this is the, the story I want to tell in four points. The first is I'm going to talk about the grant problem. And I do believe there is a, a fundamental disconnection here. I want to talk about the context of that, like how important grants are. They're not auxiliary. They're not extra or side missions. Promising mechanisms. We love allocation mechanisms. If you're in this room, you never heard of QF. It's a strange place to be. Okay. So, so we'll talk about promising ones and like what they offer and then what are some of the shortfalls. And then I want to present this idea of what is quadratic acceleration. We're calling it QAC for short and the realignment it brings. And then bring a reminder to ourselves on what was the original vision of tokenization and have we lost track of the mission? Okay, so the context of the grants problem. If, raise your hand, you heard of the alignment problem in AI. How do you get the machines doing what we want them to do, right? I, I think there's something like a grants alignment problem. And it, just to speak of, on how central grants are to this whole thing, really, if you boiled it down, you could say all blockchains effectively govern two things, protocol rules and value flows. Okay, because that's how a chain autonomously propagates and sustains itself. And the sizes of this stuff is amazing. You hear these chains are like, we're giving away 5 million. You're like 5 million to the, this, uh, these other guys did that last week, right? So all the numbers now are like 100 million, 200 million. It's like Dr. Evil levels of how much money is being allocated. But what's interesting is when you really boil it down, most of the time, this is the situation we're in. A protocol has a finite number of tokens that they come into existence through a TGE, token generation event, they begin to spend those tokens. And because they're finite, they have a burn and the burn is limited. Okay. Based upon their spend, there will come a time when the game is over. And the only way to win is to create utility adoption, create some system that runs itself so that by the time you reach the end of your runway, you've achieved there and you see these inter intersecting lines. And this makes a difference between actually being solvent in four years or being irrelevant and coming up with some plan B. And this meme here, given the amount and the impact of this stuff, it's, this is the heartbeat of blockchain of DAOs. If we don't get, if we don't get this right, then you're dead. And I like this, uh, any small improvement to grants leads us to type four Kardashev civilization, which is optimum utilization of all energy and solar system. Certainly an overstatement, but maybe not. And so what is the alignment problem? If you really boil it down there, you could say there's three overarching stakeholders in a grant context. There's the protocols. They're the ones with the native token. What do they want? They want TVL. They want utility. And when they're doing direct grants, what they get is token dumping because the team, as soon as they get these tokens, they have to sell them because they just can't have the wind blow. And now they, they have to pay bills and pay people, right? So protocols want TVL, they want utility, they get token dumping. The bigger the program, the bigger the dump. Teams, teams want revenue. They're not in the game of chasing grants. They're in the game of building something interesting and what do they get instead? Instead of revenue, they basically are forced every couple of months to go find some more grants. And they don't want to be in this situation, but they're in this situation, which effectively is a hostage negotiation. We have to go to each chain and say, hey, we'll deploy on you, but you got to give us something because this is the only way we survive, right? And then the third, and this one's often overlooked, is the communities. Communities, they're not on the team and they're not the protocol, but they want this thing and they're very supportive of it. And what do they want? They want ownership. This is the overarching promise of Web3 is the ownership piece. And what do they get instead? They pray for an airdrop. 
when you do get the airdrop, know that the VCs got it first and you're most likely exit liquidity, okay? Because the VCs got it on a simple agreement for future tokens. And so this is the alignment, as in there is no alignment. You see these three circles are not uh, overlapping at all. Let's shift gears here now and talk about two promising mechanisms. There's so many smart people that have sensed that there was something very promising and unique. It's like everyone had part of a dream of this flux capacitor. And, and I feel like finally we're seeing like a clearer picture of what could be here, okay? And quadratic funding is amazing. It's extremely powerful. And it came out, the three authors here, 2018, incorporates the major stakeholders. So this is a big deal. This is an improvement over direct prospective grants. So that's awesome. And it multiplies funds. Think about the impact of the burn now. Now the protocol, instead of just giving money to a team, they dump it and they have so much of a runway. Now it's the more people who love these projects, they contribute their funds. And so maybe a protocol effectively doubles their, extends their runway, right? But what does it lack? Lacks incentives. There may be a general incentives for me to donate to my favorite projects, but they are not concrete and direct. And in fact, after a few cycles, we may see people are burned out on the donating. You know what I mean? Because it's human nature. I mean, if we don't believe incentives, then we're probably in the wrong line of business, okay? So it lacks incentives. And this one's very interesting too. It doesn't create any net new value. Just think about it. The money that goes to the team can never be greater than just the combined money that came from the protocol and the donations. No new thing has been created, okay? You can see this little animation here. Protocols putting in funding pot, people donate, magnifies the funds to the teams. So there's something promising there and you see the shortfalls. Now let's switch to the next one. The next one is bonding curves. There's magic in this, okay? Now, the shortest way I can describe a bonding curve, and I'll just do this, is, is there's kind of two big bonding curves. There's the secondary bonding curve, which we think of as DEXs, where basically two tokens go to a contract, and then we're able to trade those when the price is set based upon the rules of that contract. This is all decentralized exchanges. This is how it works. The other is a primary issuance bonding curve, which you only put in one token and that contract creates a new token. And so that's the, the bonding curve that we're concerned about here. It is amazing and magical because it creates a one-sided market. In your typical decks, you need to incentivize people to come and put the resources in there to create these pools. These bonding curves are nuts because people can just put in one token and get a new token out. It's a tokenization primitive. And you get organic price discovery. Right now, most of the time how price discovery happens is you do an airdrop, you create liquidity pools, and you see where things land, whereas this is programmatically determined. The price is programmatically determined based on the supply. But where, what are the shortcomings with the bonding curve? Two, one, they're expensive to start. You can create a billion tokens right now and airdrop them, and what does it cost you? Oh, 30 bucks in gas fees, maybe? With the bonding curve, something has to go in of value. Even, it doesn't matter who you are. If the talent makes a bonding curve, he has to put in a reserve asset in order for it to work. So it's expensive to start. You can't just ex nihilo, create tokens from nothing. And it's expensive to retain. Because let's say you get in, you're great, you got price discovery, you got these tokens and all this, and now it's okay, now we have all this money locked in the curve and it's just sitting there not doing anything. So what the hell do we do now? That's not the optimum capital management efficiency. And so this is the innovation. Quadratic Acceleration, QF. It's a combination of QF and a special class of bonding curve called the augmented bonding curve that is used to tokenize projects and extend that tokenization access to, token. to communities. And so instead of a protocol giving a direct grant to a team, it goes into a bonding curve, which creates a new token economy. That team gets the first initial large portion of those tokens, and then a QF est round is held where when people donate, they don't donate for nothing. They actually donate and it generates tokens and it creates access for those donors, okay? And this is the novel mechanism, all right? And what does it do? It provides QF with incentives and bonding curves with capital, all right? One of the innovations of the augmented bonding curve 
is it takes a fee, you can set a fee as a parameterized element for all mints and burns. And so now you have this perpetual revenue source on all economic activity in this bonding curve. And with QAP, what we're doing as well is we're automatically provisioning these tokens in liquidity pools on a DEX with the idea that eventually you want to graduate beyond a bonding curve. And so with sufficient liquidity in a secondary market, we actually unlock all that collateral in the bonding curve. So there's a giant pot of gold at the end. And this is a very short description of the QAC approach. The, the shortest takeaway I want you to take is you just take QF and take the augmented bonding curve and put it in the metal as, a, as an engine. And then functionally what this does though, consider how it changes all the incentives of these three stakeholders in the most crazy way. First off, protocols get unbelievable TVL. The, the original code word for this project before we came up with QAC was TVL machine. Okay, because it's, it's predictive, right? And they get token utility because guess what? Now, if I want to participate in all these new projects and stuff, I need the token. I need that protocol token in order to donate to these different projects to get those new tokens created, okay? This has massive effect on the protocols burn and all the rest. What do projects get? Projects get a revenue stream and token economies. We don't have the time in 15 minutes or less to go into the calculations like these predictive deterministic calculations. But you know, when you tell a team like, hey, would you rather have a one-time $50,000 grant or an $8 million token economy at the end of the year? I think that's a pretty easy question to answer, right? And then lastly, what do communities get? Communities get the promise of Web3. Ownership, participation, access. And this is our proposal for solving the grant alignment problem. And a little reminder on the vision of Web3 about one of the guys that really inspired me, and it was funny, I said something about this guy, and Griff is like, hey, we're talking to him on Tuesday. It was like when we first met and stuff. But this guy, Simon De La Gru, I don't want to say his last name very well, but he helped this big lead on just defining the ERC-20 standard. And this guy, just look at his, in 2013, he's talking about personal tokens. He's talking about tokenizing everything. He's talking about, we're going to tokenize projects, songs, contracts, articles, 10 second organizations, idea derivations. He says, every form of value will be tokenized. But then where are we at now? We did not get that. Okay. Tokenization happens at right now at late stage in a project's development, extremely VC backed because it has to be because it costs $200,000 to launch a token. Okay. And so th this promise of when the value of coordination systems costs less than the cost to coordinate, the whole world changes. That vision is still present, but I think it's been lost to a great degree. And so this is the inflammatory revolutionary kind of mindset I have in thinking about this is crypto web three has a swap primitive in the decks, but it doesn't have a creation primitive that hasn't been presented yet. And so to put legs on this, we're actually going to do this. Polygon has given us a grant to build this. This has been being built over the past several months. We're the QX team. We're going to tokenize 10 projects. Each of those projects is going to get a $50,000 grant. It's going to tokenize them. We're going to run QS rounds in which people can donate and get access to those uh, projects tokens. The automatic DEX provisioning is going to be built in, perpetual revenue. And when they reach a certain reserve ratio under the curve, it'll unlock. And so when the whole game comes to an end, it may be in the end that key turns and they're sitting on a million bucks, perpetual revenue source and a whole tokenized economy. is something more, very different than a one-time one -time grant. Websites Live, we haven't even really tweeted this real strong yet. We're kind of planning with Polygon on how to talk about it. And so you guys really are some, some first people to hear this in this way. Giveth is instrumental in this because there's all these people already donating on Giveth. They already know how this works and what it's about. And so you can learn more about this at qact.giveth.io. And put your email and you'll be notified when this goes live. And the big call to action is if projects sort of pre-token, we want to talk to them. We want that we want amazing first 10 projects or if protocols that are already deployed on ZK EVM that want to use their token more effectively, we want to talk to them as well. Polygon's wild, gave us money to build this, they're funding the first cohort, giveth, this man's a wild man, this is happening. Common stack, all the freaking 
mind share in research and just insight that's come out of there. Body curve research group, it's just incredible. An inverter, parameterized, augmented bonding curve, infra. It's just awesome. Thanks, everybody. Are there any questions? Yeah. Do projects that you're looking for projects that also already have a token? Like, what would it look like for that? That's great. It's there's two sides of this thing. There's projects that want to tokenize. Then there's established projects that have tokens, and they're looking to lean deeper into the self-propagation. And maybe in the old days, 10 minutes ago, they would have done this with a grant program. And maybe they're like, let's start out of the gate doing it a bit different. And maybe we want to start out of the gate by incentivizing by doing it in this QAC way via this kind of tokenizing projects. Does that answer? So if the project already had this open, they'd be coming in and then also launching the bonding curve, but like then connecting to their... No, they would fund around. So they would say, hey, we want these type of projects to deploy on us, to extend, to build on our stack. And we're willing to fund this kind of round in which projects get selected, get tokenized, and that. Yeah. Can you sort of expand on uh, what you mean by when you say, well, people get the promise of Web3. Oh, yeah. The promise of airdrop, because probably it was project. That's not Web3, right? No, I don't think it is. What do you mean by that? People are the promise of Web3. Uh, I'd say the promise is ownership. And that hasn't been, like, we had that little bit with the ICOs. The, the ICOs were basically like, this is illegal. Securities laws, it's not, it's, and you can't do this anymore. And so what happened is now the promise is either if you're an accredited investor, you engage directly and you put up money and you get certainty that you're going to have tokens, or you kind of try to provide value and hope for an airdrop, or maybe just get it when it's freely flowing. The only solution if someone says, can we replicate the mechanism of the ICOs, but in a decentralized fashion? And the only way to do that is to replace that dynamic with a decentralized mechanism. And that's why the bonding curve in combination with QF is very interesting because the very token generation, it's not sold, it's generated from the contract. So it's decentralized as generation and in its distribution because QF determines how people get it. So the, the promise is direct ownership and it's been hijacked by regulatory requirements. Yeah. Does that answer? Oh, pan air. Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, it's just said, I guess, when you do something like this, there is a particular kind of project for give us a survey. Like. Oh, for sure. So I, this in no way contradicts the plurality approach. And so it's, it's the right tool for the right job. My strong contention, our strong contention would be like, right now tokenization isn't even on the table for an early stage project. It's like, they need to get further along at the VC and it's held off a real long time. Whereas now that can be much earlier. The utility on your token can grow and change over time. And the initial utility on QAC is access to the team. Polygon, so they're gonna use the native token to run the rounds, but then they also, there also is Giveth itself, which is gonna use a give token. And it has a unique, different focus on the type of projects it wants to fund and support that are going to be far more oriented towards public goods and regen and, and all this type of stuff. And then I can't go to that, but GURVS is the secret word, right? And so, GURVS is the word. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the idea is you, you can apply, we should be able to apply the mechanism in any type of context and domain. And really, it just needs to have a continuity and a consistency with the program and the player call that's supporting. So this is just really a lot, a lot bigger thing. No, you're just launching here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm kicked off, so. Wow, thank you, Tessa. Oh, it was great, though.